protection printers and so much more bondwell fiji's number one in it this is street talk with bj norayan brought to you by bondwell Good evening, I'm VJ Narayan, you on Straight Talk tonight, another leader and of course another night of straight talking from you as you ask your questions and as we ask questions to find out what this party has to offer to you uh, as we go into uh, uh, the 2014 general elections uh, with uh, just uh, less than a month away and uh, confirmation coming through from the elections office that we'll have the national candidates list announcement now on Saturday afternoon and it starts at around 3 o'clock in the afternoon where we will uh, uh, go and witness the drawing of the numbers uh, with the candidates names and straight after that of course you will have to find out uh, which candidate you have decided to vote for and what number they have and then of course with these uh, elections you will have to go and uh, tick cross or circle that particular number on the ballot paper when the elections is held and we will be giving um, a shot uh, of uh, straight talk uh, uh, for each leader we're getting a lot of interest building up and uh, uh, some parties called in uh, asking when are we coming on we have uh, approached all the parties and uh, but tomorrow is uh, a cool off period for you you can uh, relax a bit friday night we won't have any straight talk tomorrow night but we have uh, uh, next monday night uh, we have uh, the leader of the national federal Party, Dr. Biman Prasad, and next Tuesday night, uh, the leader of uh, the People's Democratic Party, Mr. Felix Anthony, and uh, we have uh, proposed to the Fiji First uh, that uh, they come in uh, with the leader, uh, Vorenge Banimarama, on Wednesday night. Of course, uh, we are awaiting his uh, confirmation on that. He leaves for Australia and uh, will be back early next week and we expecting a confirmation on when he comes on and at the same time we expected to double up some leaders and have some uh, issues threshed out and for you to make the decision which are the best policies or which parties you'd like to vote for in this uh, next election tonight we have uh, um, the leader of the Fiji Labour Party, Mr. Mahendra Chaudhry, uh, he's, uh, he's decided to continue to be the leader, despite, uh, of course, the nomination has been rejected by the elections office. Uh, Mr. Chaudhry, uh, we'll talk about that a bit uh, later on, but good evening and thank you for accepting our invitation tonight. Thank you very much, Vijay, and very good evening to all the listeners. Bola, namaste, Aslam alaikum. You're on Straight Talk, and the number to call to ask questions is 3314766. That number again, 3314766. Call and ask your question <coughs> on what <coughs> matters to you as we go to the elections. Now, Mr. Chaudhry, going through your manifesto, uh, a number of issues have been raised. Uh, we'll, we'll talk a few about that bef before we take some questions. Uh, you have said in your manifesto that you will review the 2013 Constitution. How will you do that? Well, once the parliament is in place, it will be done through the parliamentary process. The constitution needs to be reviewed. And those who are saying that this constitution is democratic and it is good for Fiji have not properly read the constitution. In the interest of Fiji, every party must oppose this constitution. And I think they have all done so, with the exception of Fiji first. The constitution is not democratic. It concentrates power in the hands of the Prime Minister and the Attorney General. It does not provide for a separation of powers between the legislature, the executive and the judiciary. <coughs> and uh, it has got serious flaws in so far as the appointment of judges are concerned because it's influenced by the Prime Minister and the Attorney Let's General. Go there. Let's go there about and appointment <coughs> of judges. Who appoints the judges? Well, the President will appoint the judges, but on the There's advice... A commission. There's yes. a commission. There will be a commission in place. Yes. Including the leader of opposition. Yes. Including a member of the public for the first time. Yes. And uh, do you have a problem with that? Or well, what would you want? The Attorney General should not be a part of that. Uh, so you don't want the Attorney process. General yes. to be part of it. Yes. New Zealand and Australia have the Attorney General advising and uh, appointment is made by the Prime Minister? Well, Fiji never had that. So? Fiji never had that and... Uh, the Attorney General is the chief legal advisor to the government. Right. And I think the judiciary should be independent of his influence. So, what if New Zealand and Australia have this set up, it's working for them, what's your thought on that? 
I am not very familiar with the Australian and New Zealand system. I am talking about Fiji and I think it would be best to keep the Attorney General, who is the Chief Legal Advisor of the Government, out of the system. That's your stay is the Fiji Labour yes, Party? Yes, indeed it is. Okay. And uh, which other parts are undemocratic? Well, the rights, the, f uh, the Bill of Rights, if you look at them, it gives you rights on the one hand. Then there are these decrees, these repressive decrees which take away those rights. I'm talking about trade union rights, the rights of the workers, for instance. The Bill of Rights provision in the Constitution says, all right, you have the right to f uh, form trade unions and to engage in collective bargaining, etc., etc. But if you have uh, <coughs> essential national industries, yes. then you have some limitations. Not some limitations. I think they, they have no no rights at all. They, have, they can have their collective bargaining units set up. Yes, they but, can. But, but no one from outside to come in. Yes, that's, uh, that is not in line with the core ILO convention, 98, which uh, allows for free collective bargaining. Fiji is a member state of the International Labour Organization, and it must therefore uh, follow the core conventions of that organization. These core conventions were being followed, but uh, of course with the promulgation of this decree, the National Essential Servi uh, Services Decree, those rights have been taken away. Then in the public service, the public servants don't have any rights at all, they've been taken away also. So it means very little to say that you have these rights when you have a decree which overrides the provisions of the Constitution, mind you, and takes those rights away. The government has said on the record, we've asked those questions, that any party that comes in can just get rid of the decrees it's their call because the decrees do not need that 75 percent support in the house and 75 percent support of the registered voters that is neither here nor there why are the decrees still there when the constitution has been so put you in want place? the decrees out indeed and, and we've made those representations through the guy commission the guy uh, draft constitution uh, provided for these decrees to be uh, revoked uh, with the coming in force of the constitution but that's not being done so there is a lot of double talk about this constitution and I think this constitution must go in totality well it must be reviewed substantial parts in of totality it. well most of it let me let me tell you that it, it provides it does not provide for accountability and transparency it has a very very outrageous provision where the prime minister chairs the constitu independent constitutional officers commission that's unheard of, because these constitutional officers are supposed to be independent, independent of government, of the executive. But we here we have a ridiculous situation where the Prime Minister chairs it, he's got the Attorney General sitting with him, and two other members of the government. Plus, only plus some other people. Just one leader of the opposition and his nominee. Mm -hmm. So there's four to two. But then, where, where is independence of this commission if the Prime Minister chairs it with the Attorney General and two other government nominees? This is ridiculous. I mean, this, it's, so this, this is what I was saying, that there is uh, there's no, you know, uh, the, the, the doctrine of separation yeah, of your, powers. Your, your stand is that you don't want the heavy involvement of, you, you continue to say, the Attorney General in some of these Not things. the Attorney General only. I'm talking about the Prime Minister too. It is ridiculous for the Prime Minister to be chairing an independent Constitutional Officers Commission. What would be your ideal situation? for a constitutional officers. It should be commission. independent of the government of the day. The, it should be independent of the executive. Right. So gov government not to be involved Minister at all? should not be there. Uh, what about the leader of opposition and his members? He shouldn't be there. So just general it members of the government? It should be apolitical. Okay, yeah. thank you. Now, you cannot contest the elections. You won't be in parliament. What is the guarantee that whatever you say from outside will happen? I have stated my views and the views of the Fiji Labour Party and will pursue those views irrespective of what others say. No, no, I'm asking. You are the leader of the party. You are saying I will do this, we will ensure that we do that, but you will not be in parliament. What's the guarantee, whatever you are saying, will be taken through by your parliamentary leader because you cannot be the parliamentary leader? Yes, but when I talk here and in the manifesto, I talk on behalf of the party, not as an individual. And these are party's policies, and the party will carry them through. Right. So there will be a clause that they have to listen to the leader from outside? No, it's not that. It's not that. It's already in our manifesto. And the members of parliament who are elected are bound by the manifesto. That's our policy document for the next four years. And every member of parliament is bound by the manifesto of the party.
all your members are happy with you not contesting <coughs> and then still holding the leader's position? They are not happy with my not contesting. And I think this was on the agenda of the regime. Well, it's based on your conviction. From, from some time ago. But so it's we based, all, it's we all based on your conviction. Well, long before I was convicted, the Prime Minister made statements to say that Chaudhry and Garse will never be in Parliament. And you are aware of those statements he made to the uh, ABC. It's on, it's on public record. So they had planned this. This was all pre-planned as far as I'm concerned. It doesn't bother but me. But if you didn't have a conviction, you wouldn't be in this trouble. This provision which has come in, it was specially enacted. It, is, it was not there in the previous electoral legislation of Fiji. Yeah, but I'm saying if you, were, the, if you were not convicted of this breach of exchange control act, you wouldn't have been in trouble. That is not the point. The point what is, is the point? No, that is not the point. The point is whether such a provision was in previous electoral legislation or was this especially designed to keep certain individuals out, VJ? So you, would and you uh, want convicted people to contest? It's not a matter of that. Oh no, what's your stand on that? The stand is that this kind of provision wasn't there. It applied to people who were serving a sentence of imprisonment. They were kept out, and an undischarged bankrupt were kept out, and people of unsound mind were kept out. Otherwise, the provision was, if you are a registered voter, you can be a candidate. That was the, that was the provision. Now, I was not convicted of any offense of dishonesty. Breach of exchange control right. act, where the, uh, where the sentence is more than 12 months. Yes, yeah. but it is not an offense of dishonesty. What the court said that I should have brought the money in Fiji and I did not do that, so I was convicted. This matter is still before the courts. I have appealed to the Supreme Court against the uh, decision of the appeals court, so I'd leave it at that. But the point is, how did the Prime Minister know two years ahead of my conviction that I would be convicted? Well, that's and your assumption again. again. No, that's your assumption not, again. not my assumption. He made the statement. It's on record, Vijay, and you know it. That's your assumption, Mr. Chaudhry. Not my assumption. It's there on record. Vijay, admit it. No, 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 no. Let, let's, not, uh, let's not get angry, Mr. Chaudhry. I'm not getting angry, but you must... I'm, you just, must saying, I'm yeah. just saying that now there's a set of rules in place. You accepted to contest the elections under those rules. Listen. You, your party has accepted to contest the elections under those rules. Listen. Yes or no? Listen. Yes or no? No. You we, do, we don't like those rules. You don't we, like we those are rules, forced but forced to contest, contest the elections. We are forced to contest, right? Because we want to get this regime out. And unless we contact, uh, contest, we won't be able to do that. Now, <laughs> the point is, these rules keep being changed. Just three weeks ago, there was another amendment to the electoral decree, right? About residential qualifications. And this is how the regime has manipulated this process throughout. Once the process has begun, you do not change rules. Once the game has begun, you do not change the rules um, halfway through the game. But this is exactly what has been happening. The Tony General has been going and getting decrees out, changing rules, changing the goalpost and, and all that. So the whole electoral process itself, and we've said this publicly, Vijay, is, is tainted. It's being manipulated by the regime. And it is grossly unfair. It cannot be regarded as a free, fair and credible election. Then not why, not then only on that count. Then why contest if you, s you do not have... Because we have a point to prove. Because we have a point to prove, Vijay, that you know, despite all these handicaps, we can still do the job. Okay, thank you very much for your stand there. We'll go to callers. Gabby Morrell from Suva, he is asking if FLP forms the next government, will wages for security guards around Fiji be increased? Wages for all low-paid workers will certainly be reviewed and we do believe that there are many uh, employees who need, whose ne wages need to be adjusted, particularly those who are in the lower income bracket. A minimum wage of $2 an hour, which was set by the government not long ago, is ridiculous. And that certainly has to be reviewed. And I think taking into account the cost of living, which is very high indeed, there is definitely a case for a thorough review of wages in Fiji, particularly for the lower income brackets. I'm sure Gabby would, and many others would want to know what m minimum r wage rate you would set. Would you have a national minimum wage rate? We have said that we're looking at between 3 to $4 an hour. 
3 to $4 an hour. We've said so. You believe that some industries can afford to pay that much? If they can't, let them show course why they can't. Okay. Eroni from Samambula has uh, got uh, a question uh, from Samambula. Eroni, good, good evening. Okay, good evening, Mr. Chaudhary. I believe you was uh, Minister for Finance in the Banamatama government. What do you think about the economy in Garcia's time, your time, and now? Thank you. Well, I didn't get the question. Are you asking me to compare the state of the economy during Garcia's time and now? When you were in government with Mr. Benimaram. Yes. <coughs> But I think the question, uh, did I get the question right, that it is to compare the state of the economy during Mr. Ngarasa's time and, and now? Yeah. Well, it's some eight years ago that uh, Mr. Ngarasa was in charge of the economy. And the growth rate was modest, although there was a growth rate. But uh, in... Um, the current situation, out of eight years, we've had five years of negative growth. And only recently the economy has uh, picked up, but uh, the on, uh, the, it is still in, a, in, a, uh, in stagnation. And I think a lot needs to be done to revitalize the economy. So uh, a lot has happened in the eight years. The investment climate has not improved. And... Uh, this has led to uh, job losses and of course the, the policy of the government itself has been uh, to, uh, uh, through reforms to lay off workers. So there's been quite uh, a uh, significant uh, number of jobs which have been lost. And this has uh, added to poverty because those who have lost their jobs naturally have lost their livelihoods. So these are the concerns and this is why poverty has risen compared to 2006 when it was at 32% of the population, today it stands at uh, roughly 45% of the population. So that is the rough measure if you want to look at uh, the state of the economy. I always measure it in terms of how the people are doing. I think if one says the economy is doing well and one on the other hand looks at the people, they are not doing well, then it doesn't make sense. If the economy is doing well, then the people should be doing well. and uh, the, economy should, uh, the, the poverty rate should then be declining. But that has not happened. And similarly with unemployment, unemployment rate has also shot up. So these are uh, uh, social indicators which show that uh, the economy can't be doing well if the people are not doing well. <coughs> now, uh, w you were in uh, Mr. Banimarama's government. One of the things that you brought in and, um, and uh, the government had to enforce that was a pay cut for civil servants. Do you regret that decision now? No, the pay cut was... Uh, not decided by the government. It was uh, on the advice of the uh, the uh, civil servants, the finance ministry at that time, that there could be repercussions as a result of the coup. We all know what happens to the economy and all what happens to government finances when uh, <coughs> a uh, event such as a coup takes place. And therefore, uh, the need there was a need to cut government expenditure. And I think there was a reduction of 5% in the salaries of civil servants as a as an, an interim measure, and the salaries were fully restored, but not by, backdated. By the end of uh, uh, 2007, they, they were 2008. Back to, uh, 2007. Beginning, beginning of 2008, but <coughs> it, was no, it was not backdated. No, it was not backdated. Now, uh, we know that you won the Great Council of Chiefs back. That's one of the, uh, one of your issues in the manifesto. Why do you want the GCC back? Vijay, the manner in which the unceremonious manner in which the GCC was disbanded. I think it's, uh, we all must respect each other's culture and tradition and their cultural values. And if the, it's, a, it's, a, it's the apex organization of the indigenous community and they look upon it with some reverence. Now, let them decide whether they want the GCC or they don't want the GCC, rather than it being imposed on them uh, in a manner which is very hurtful to them. And I think, uh, you know, um, people that I have talked to widely, they, they resent this, the manner in which their chiefs have been 
insulted, they have been put aside and rebuked, and rebuked rather, rebuked because Prime Minister Bani Marama has also made remarks rebuking the chiefs. I don't want to say this here, but you, you know what I'm meaning. And, and this has hurt the Fijian people very much, the indigenous community very much. And this is what I don't like, not to impose anything uh, on the people, and it's a sensitive issue, and uh, the people themselves should decide such been, issues. You, there, there were, you were at the centre of one of the uh, issues when, uh, when the, the 2000 coup occurred, and in 2001 when uh, the court ruled that you could come back, I'll read you something from the GCC chairman at the time, Mr. Sitiveni Rambuka. This is a transcript from the ABC uh, Late Line interview in 2001 after the court ruling. <coughs> Major General Sitiveni Rambuka, quote, I personally believe that it would not be a good thing for Fiji if Mr. Chaudhry comes back. So it is up to the Labour Party, in fact the People's Coalition, to be pragmatic about their choice of a leader, one whom they believe they will be in the best interest of Fiji to put into that position. From what we have seen in the event since they took over office in May of 1999 is that Mr. Mahendra Chaudhry, although democratically and constitutionally the choice for Prime Minister, may not be the best choice for Fiji at this time. Do you think a chairman of the GCC should have been making these kind of comments? Do you think <coughs> if the GCC should come back, should come back in this sort of form that they can say a democratically elected prime minister cannot be the prime minister? Certainly not. First of all, we must see who made that statement. It was uh, Mr. Mbuka. As the chairman of the GCC. Whatever. And he was the one who was unseated by the People's Coalition government by the Labour Party. So he brought in some sentiments into it probably. Uh, that was not a correct statement to make. But that does not necessarily mean that the GCC should be scrapped. Now, the uh, GCC needs reforms. There's no doubt about that. In a reformed version, you want it back. The point is this that when the 1997 constitution was being, uh, I'm talking now about uh, the Reeves report. In the Reeves report, you'll find a whole section devoted to the GCC, how the GCC should be restructured, who should be its members, and what should be its functions, and all that. Now, those were very important recommendations, but these recommendations were not taken on board by Mr. Rambuka, who was then the Prime Minister, and no changes were made to the GCC. And uh, our position on that is, reinstate the GCC, take a look at the recommendations of the Reeves Commission on the restructuring of the GCC, on the reforms of the GCC, and implement them, because I think those are very good recommendations, but nobody talks about that. And we need to revisit those recommendations and um, we'll need to re-look re at that. Yeah. As you said, no one's talking about that. Now, can the FLP work with Sodelpa? A post-coalition is now being suggested. Before you answer that, this was your assessment of Garcia and the former SDL when you were interim finance minister in 2008. I don't know why he doesn't want all this to happen. Now, he has uh, six years in which to do it, but under his stewardship, the country suffered. The country was divided. Race-based policies, uh, you know, took uh, the center stage and uh, the economy was uh, badly affected. And these are all the uh, issues which uh, have arisen as a result of his, uh, his misrule, the six years that he was prime minister of this country. So uh, it is a golden opportunity for him to cooperate, to make amends for the wrongs that he has committed on the people of Fiji and uh, assist in the process of building a new Fiji. Of course, your views have changed now because you said you change along with time. But at that time, you wanted Mr. Garase to work with Mr. Bainimarama and that he had brought Fiji to misrule of more than six years. What's your comment now on that? As far as I'm concerned, the comments I made then were correct because government finances, when I took over as finance minister, were in dire straits. In a mess, uh, the foreign reserves. What were, were the fo what were the foreign reserves? The foreign reserves had been uh, was down to three hundred million. That about was quite one, scary for one, Fiji. Yes, about one point three months of import. So that was the situation, and the deficit 
the budget deficit was quite high. So there's no doubt about that. Hmm. Because that's on record. Yeah. It's there, it's published, it's on record. There's no point in denying that. Government finances had to be stabilized, they had to be fixed. And it was just because of this that I joined Mani Marama's administration. I was invited to do so by the then president, Ratu Josefa Iloilo. It was his invitation, personal invitation. Look, this is the situation. We want you to come in and please assist. And within a year, we had put up that reserves back to $900 million. We had stabilized government finances. And mind you, $900 million, pre-devalued dollar, not devalued dollar. So that had been done. And it was critical at that time. To, to um, Otherwise, Fiji could have been in dire straits. And uh, that having been done, I stand by my comments then. So, uh, But we can't live in the past. We've got to move on. I think that's very important. A lot of governments have come. They've done different things. As leader of the opposition, they, they were critical. I mean, to say, if you look at Mr. Reddy and Rambuka, they decided to work together after disagreeing so violently or vehemently. So we can't be living in the past. What we are saying now <coughs> is, is, is that you, you quest your question was about Sodelpa, not about uh, so much about Karase. Karase is no longer, uh, he, he no longer leads uh, Sodelpa. He's, he's not uh, a leader of a, any political party. The coalition with Sodelpa will depend on what the policies are. And I think uh, the leader of Sodelpa made that clear uh, just uh, earlier this week. Mm. So it is a post-election coalition that we talked about. We haven't settled on anything yet, but we have decided that should it be possible, then we should work together and have a post-election coalition. And I think that arrangement was thought of more because we would like to see the two major communities in Fiji come together. That is the central theme behind this. And if it is possible to reconcile the differences yeah. and reconcile the differences in policies and come together to rebuild Fiji, Fiji so will definitely need rebuilding. So when you're saying Sodelpa and Fiji Labour Party, meaning that two different communities coming together, mm. these two parties represent two different communi communities separately? So it is. Fiji I'm Labour Party, uh, indeed. A Fiji Labour Party is what? Uh, uh, an Indo Fijian party? No, but majority of our supporters are Indo Fijians, as majority of supporters of Sodelpa are the indigenous community. I'm a realist. Let's let's not hide our, you know, <coughs> heads in the sand like an ostrich. Uh, we're, we're talking straight we're talk here. Yeah, so yeah. let's talk yeah, facts. So let, let let's be realistic let's about it. That's, let's that's talk how it is. Yeah. So that's how it is, and. Uh, Many attempts have been made in the past to, to integrate the political thinking of these two communities, but that has not been possible on account of factors I, I wouldn't want to go into now. But this is an opportunity, and I think we should not let it pass if, by. If you have that opportunity now, hmm. why are you not announcing the coalition that you will go together and form government now? Why are you saying we'll see after the elections? That is not my choice. Labour Party suggested, as you know, the we had the oh, we had the United Front for a Democratic Fiji that was formed some three years ago, and we're working together. And uh, my position was that in the elections, all the three parties which were in the UFDF, they should contest the elections under a single banner. They should share seats and contest the elections under uh, under one banner. Unfortunately, uh, this was not acceptable to Sodelpa and the National Federation Party. Their position was that we should contest the elections as individual parties, and then, after the elections, uh, talk about a post-election coalition. So that was that. Labour's choice was no. Let's 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 have a pre-election coalition if possible. But uh, the other two uh, didn't want it that way. They said. Uh, so they've left you out, out of the picture for now until after the elections. Right. So 
that that's what that's what the arrangement is. I think the NFP is not in this now. They are not committing themselves to even a post-election coalition. Uh, they have said that we'll decide after the elections whether to be in a post-election coalition or not. Well, it's their choice. Yes, indeed. We'll take a short break. Uh, when we come back, uh, you can talk to uh, the leader of the Fiji Labour Party, Mr. Mahendra Chaudhry. Jarvis, status report. I'm sorry, sir. We brought auxiliary power. Shut down sequence initiated. Well, do this to me, Jarvis, just a little further. Negative, sir. My components are old and out of date. Oh, come on, man. Where am I supposed to get quality computer components from then? Go to Bondwell, sir. Jarvis? Jarvis! Bondwell. Fiji's number one in IT. Quality IT products, laptops, smartphones, and accessories. Looking to build your own computer? See Bondwell for all your part requirements. We also stock security cameras, power protection, printers, and so much more. Bondwell, Fiji's number one in IT. Tonight is the leader of the Fiji Labour Party. The number to call for your questions uh, is 3314766. 3314766. You're live on VTFM and Radio Sargam and also going live around Fiji and around the world through our website fijivillage.com. Our video streaming straight talk dash Fiji Labour Party. Now, our next caller online is Umesh from Baulevu. Good evening, Umesh. Okay, the question to Mr. Choudhury is when he, when we voted for him in 1999, uh, and he, this was his uh, plea that he'll raise the wages for the 
government workers and everybody. And that was not done. And that one he is saying again today that he will do it for the security. Is he going to do it? Or will his government going to do it? Because he will not be in the parliament. So what assurance is he going to give us that the wage is going to go up? Mr. Chaudhary? Uh, let's get the facts right. The wages of government workers did go up. Now, when we were in power, between 99 and 2000, we've already said in our, many, uh, uh, in our statement that we're looking at a minimum wage of between 3 and $4 an hour. So that in itself is uh, an indication, a firm indication, that wages in the garment industry will go up. Thank you, Mr. Chaudhry. Just, uh, just moving on a bit, what is your view on the Pacific Islands Forum uh, continuing to take the stand that Fiji needs to have elections and then return to the forum? I support that stand. I think uh, every organization, they have their own rules. And this is not a new rule, it's an old rule. And uh, Fiji has, uh, uh, by uh, not... Uh, <coughs> staying within the rules, they have been suspended, its membership has been suspended until such time as it satisfies the Do you rules. think Australia and New Zealand push the agenda there? No, it will apply to any, uh, any country, not just to Fiji. If there was a coup in Papua New Guinea, uh, the same principles would apply. This is under the Big Hour Declaration. The same principles would apply. Uh, uh, and uh, I think uh, there, there can't be any argument about it. We'll have, we'll have two pieces playing now of uh, your interview earlier, Mr. Chaudhry, in 2008 about uh, the Forum New Zealand Australia and uh, also issue on elections in uh, March 2009. The Forum should be more concerned about assisting Fiji in resolving this particular issue and not putting it into a corner and uh, making demands on it. I feel that uh, the Forum itself will be weakened without Fiji's presence. I don't think in the long term Fiji has much to lose if it's not a member of the forum, to be quite honest. I myself have had reservations about the usefulness of the forum, because I see it largely as an organization dominated by Australia and then by New Zealand. Island nations have had very little to say in shaping the forum. I think they're being unrealistic. Uh, definitely elections by March 2009 is out. And as you know, that currently uh, work is being done on electoral reforms. I believe, and so does the Labour Party believe, that we need electoral reforms to make our electoral system truly representative and democratic. As it is, it is seriously flawed. And I think uh, those who uh, talk about early elections in Fiji need to first of all understand that electoral reforms are absolutely necessary before we go into the next elections. We've had communal politics dominate parliament here and that has been the root cause of division and discord in, uh, in our society. And I think uh, those who uh, want to turn a blind eye to that are doing grave injustice to Fiji. Now let's assess that, Mr. Chaudhry, based on what you've said. Uh, that's in 2008 when you were Interim Minister for Finance in the Bainimarama led government. You said the forum is not useful. New Zealand and Australia had put Fiji in a corner. Yes. You've changed the view now? No, I have not changed my you view. You have changed the view? No, I have not. Why have you changed well, the view? You asked me a question about the position of the forum with regard to Fiji. Right. And my answer was, yes, that is the position because the rules say so. Right. Under the Bikatawa Declaration, if democracy is usurped, a democratic government is overthrown in any country, then a certain course of action comes into play the uh, suspension, etc., etc., which Fiji had to go through. But what I said is that the forum needs to look at it realistically and try and assist Fiji. As far as the suspension is concerned, you can't stop that. That's the, the rules say so. But then the, the, the forum kept engaged. And this is where I said that they should try and assist and overcome this. At that problem. time you had said that Fiji was being cornered? Yes. Yep. Fiji was being cornered? Yes, yes, yeah. yes, it was being cornered. You believe Fiji is not, no longer being cornered? Later on, after the engagement, and I think it was principally after 2009, after the abrogation of the constitution, I left the interim administration in 2008. And in 2009, when the constitution was abrogated, then matters became very serious. And then the, uh, the, uh, uh, the, there was a spell 
where there was absolutely no engagement between the forum and the interim administration. Do you believe that the Pacific Islands Forum is useful? Well, no. it has its flaws. I, I will I will admit that it has its flaws. I think, but principally, and when I was prime minister, I did say that the island, uh, the leadership in the island uh, nations, needed to come together to have a common objective and to have a common uh, sort of stand on on issues. But unfortunately, the island nation leaders were divided on a number of issues. We couldn't come together, and therefore we uh, were weakened. Now, so this is interpreted by many as if Australia and New Zealand are pushing us around. You said it in the in yes. your interview yes. that uh, they were pushing the agenda. Yes, because are they still pushing the agenda? It, and, and the same statement I made in relation to the <coughs> uh, uh, small states, small uh, island uh, develop uh, developing developing states. states. Yes, that we need to get together and we need to f uh, have a common platform. We can then pursue these objectives effectively at the forum level or at any other level, internationally or regionally. So, to that extent, I'll agree with you that. <coughs> no, I, I'm not saying that. You said that in your interview in yeah, 2008. To that I'll agree with you that, in certain respects, uh, the island nations are not getting. The uh, Australia and New Zealand now. are pushing the agenda? Well, I wouldn't say that agenda, maybe, yes. So you're changing your stand there, based on what you said? No, no, maybe, yeah, maybe what, what you say is right. No, no, not what but I said, it's what you said yeah. in 2008, when you were well, finance minister. Yes, indeed. But uh, they had an agenda at that time. And I think uh, when you look at, when you go back, you will see that uh, efforts were not being made by both sides. There was a promise. Uh, to do that, to engage, but this was not happening for reasons, uh, because at that time um, my, my portfolio was largely finance, it wasn't uh, foreign affairs or whatever. But now I think things have changed and there is a lot of assistance which is coming through. The forum was wanting to get Fiji back to a uh, democratic uh, government. And uh, is, your month, is your stand different now that you are no longer in this government? Is, is your stand a bit different now because you're no longer in government? What sort of stand are you talking about? Your stand, that we, your earlier interview, what you had said, it's definitely changed. I don't think it has changed. I don't think it has changed. I still have views about the forum, and I think the forum could be more uh, useful in terms of uh, its assistance to island nations. Sometimes uh, we see that they take a certain position, the, the dominant countries in the forum. Uh, but largely, as I said, we need to put our act together, the uh, island nations, and uh, I think we can things turn around. Now, our next call online, Mr. Chaudhry, is Norman from Savu Savu. Uh, good evening, Norman. Okay. Uh, Chaudhry, since uh, uh, you have been uh, with the last government, what would you say uh, the appropriate name for the Fijians here in, uh, in Fiji? Is it appropriate that uh, we should all mingle into one? Well, under the Reef's constitution, we are known as Fiji Islanders. Now we are known, or we are uh, on paper known as Fijians. There is some reservation about it by, uh, by the, some members of the indigenous community. Uh, and uh, I think some members of the Indian community as well, that they, f they feel that they should be able to retain their, uh, their identities rather than being called, uh, uh, being given a, fair, a, a common name. So I think this is a sensitive issue which needs to be looked at. As far as I'm concerned, I, I would be happy with uh, being called a Fijian or being called a Fiji Islander. But things like this need to be uh, dealt with through proper forum, through discussion, and I think the right forum for this sort of thing would be uh, the parliament, where elected representatives of, pe uh, of the people are able to discuss such issues and come to a, a decision which would be acceptable. Mr. Chaudhry, I, I believe voters would want to know what's your stand on common name. Of course, you're saying you are happy with one or the other, but mm -hmm. what is the Labour Party stand on a common name? If you do form the next government, will you change that name? Will you review it? Uh, uh, what would you do? 
It has to be decided by Parliament. So you can't give an assurance to the people on what common name? I can give my personal view. Okay, what's your personal view? My personal view will be happy with uh, Fiji Islander or with Fijian, but let it come through uh, the proper uh, forum. So Delpa is saying that Fijian should be uh, only for indigenous Fijians. They made it clear uh, on Tuesday night, uh, Sodelpa leader Rote Mumukepa was here, mm. and they said one of the changes that they'll push for when they go back, uh, if they form government, uh, is that. Now, you're thinking of uh, going into a coalition with them if that scenario does play out. Would you support them in making that change? Well, that's exactly what I was saying earlier, Vijay, that it is a sensitive issue which should be discussed between the various communities and their leaders. And I think the proper forum for that is Parliament. I did say that there is, there is a reservation about that issue in, uh, some, mm. in some communities. And it is also in the Indian community, mind you. There are people, mm. Indian people that I have met who say, well, look, I'd like to be known as an Indian. I'm proud to be an Indian. Of course, see, they were known as uh, Indo-Fijians. So, there you are. And I think we need to uh, have a thorough discussion about this and I'm sure we'll be able to emerge with a consensus. Okay, so for the people they have to wait until after the elections to see this play out and find out what will be decided. Of course then uh, the, the next step is according to this constitution if you make the change it's in the constitution you need 75 percent of support in parliament and 75 percent of the support of the registered voters. Yes, uh, under the present rules, that is so. Yep. But uh, it is, I think, something which has to go back to Parliament if people feel it that way. I'd rather that we do it that way than shove things down the throat of the people uh, if there is, uh, you know, objection to something and you're forcing your way through. And that's what's been happening. That there are such important decisions like the GCC, like the common name, like other things which have been just decreed without being conscious of the feelings of the people. And I think that is where, in a multicultural society, one has to be careful. Now, Aj Ajesh from Nusuri has a question. Uh, good evening, Ajesh. Uh, my question is, if what has Mr. Chaudhry done when he was in power, like the promises he made before election? And, and the, the other is, if Sadelpa and FLP come into power, will they make change the constitution? to make provisions for Mr. Grasse and Chaudhry to uh, be in Parliament. Thank you. I don't know what promises you are saying, Ajesh, that weren't kept by the uh, Labour government. <coughs> we were only given one year and we did a lot in that year. We, kept, we fulfilled many of our promises and that is on record. In so far as uh, changing the constitution is concerned, I've, I've said it very early in this uh, in the show that yes the constitution needs to be changed to be made more democratic okay. so well, we'll look at that you've already addressed that issue mr chaudhry now uh, flp will carry out a comprehensive review of the lta please explain do i need to explain that <laughs> you ask every other motorist will tell you what uh, they have to um, uh, how they're suffering do you scrap the lta or well, what would you do no we didn't say we'll scrap the lta if you if you look at uh, you our scrap all the fees and charges, most yes, of the fees. If, if you you'll, at, you'll uh, scrap the unpopular road user levy. Yes. You will remove the defect notice fine of fourteen dollars fifty. Yes. Now defect notice fine. Mm -hmm. If a vehicle does have a defect and you don't give a defect notice, do you think it's appropriate to take away the fine? No. You give the defect notice. Don't give the fine. You don't have to find the person because every vehicle is inspected annually they get a certificate of roadworthiness. And looking at the condition of our roads, defects are likely to occur. You know, what happens now is, if a tail light is not functioning, that's a defect notice, you pay $14.50 for that. What's the, what's the rationale for that? You give a defect notice and you ask the motorist, or whoever it is, to go and fix the defect and come back and show it to the LTA. That's what used to happen in the past. Why do they have to pay $14.50? Okay, thank you. Labor Why do they have to pay road levy? Labour will revise all fees and charges levied by LTA to make them fair to motorists. Yes. Labour will increase the speed limit on our highways to ensure yes. better flow of traffic. Now, yes. what would be the speed limit that you would be looking at? 
you see Nasori to Suva, 50 kilometers an hour. This is not for road safety, this is for extortion from the motorists, right? That's what it is for, to make money. What we said is we'll review this because at 50 hardly the traffic will flow. If everybody drives at 50 kilometers an hour on Tosori Suva Road, they don't because it's simply silly to have a speed limit that, you know, that's, uh, that's slow. And we said we'd review these speed limits to ease the traffic flow, bearing in mind uh, the road safety. So uh, I think there's a trial going on at the moment. They're reviewing it to 60 kilometers. So what are you looking yeah, at? They must have seen our manifesto and probably they're acting on <laughs> it. <laughs> Labor will review the frequency of vehicle inspection checks so that yes. motorists are not harassed on a daily basis. Exactly. Yeah. Uh, <coughs> every day you see on the road LTA inspectors. In the morning, lunchtime, in the afternoon. This is ridiculous. So if you form government, uh, we will not see LTA officers every day on the road, uh, boarding lunchtime and afternoon? We will have you know, these checks, yes, but the frequency will be reduced. Right. You don't go there every day doing these checks and, and closing traffic jams and harassing the motorists. And I think there's got to be some kind of rules, all right, fine for safety and all that. We need these checks, but not every day, three times a day. It's like taking medicine. Well, that's your point of view, Mr. Chaudhry. Now, Shamir from Tamabua is, uh, uh, has uh, got a question. Good evening, Shamir. Mr. Chaudhry, are you afraid of Fiji's progression to a developed country, as you would not be relevant in this new Fiji? Well, I wish we were progressing towards a, be becoming a developed country, but uh, indicators are that we are going in the reverse. Which indicators, Mr. Chaudhry? Rising poverty rate, rising unemployment, high cost of living, a devalued dollar. What are these? These are indicators of a, a, a you know, a, an economy which is in trouble, a nation which is in trouble. Cost of living and other issues are facing every country in the world due to inflation, high oil prices. You've been on the record saying even in 2008, 2007, that is the main reason that uh, you couldn't uh, take duty away from a number of items and you had to maintain that because people had to face reality that uh, world uh, uh, prices of food and oil prices continue to escalate. Uh, you still hold that view? Well, in the case of Fiji, what has caused this inflation, there are two reasons, and for both, for, uh, for both of which I blame the, the current regime. One was the first was devaluation of the Fiji dollar in 2009 by 20%. There was no need to devalue. The second was increasing VAT from 125 to 15%. These two measures have contributed significantly to the rise in cost of living. Now, we have a depreciated dollar. I, I don't know why a dollar was devalued. It, it assisted the tourists, but no it caused hardship to our own people because we're still a nation which imports heavily. We import food and other things. We even items which we manufacture here, raw materials for those are sourced from abroad. So there was no need to, de uh, to devalue, but it was done. And uh, mind you, after the coup in 2006, we had the IMF come up here when I was finance minister and they advised that we should de devalue. And we didn't agree. The then Governor Reserve Bank... So IMF advised to devalue the dollar? Yes. Why did they advise that we should devalue well, the Well, this dollar? is a standard prescription of I, uh, IMF. There are a lot of policies of IMF which are anti-social, which are capitalist policies. And therefore, we have to take uh, the implications of those policies on our people. The economy could do without devaluation. And we proved the point because our foreign reserves at that time were at a critical stage. So that, that solution is devalue. <laughs> but then that would have caused a lot of hardship to our people, as we saw after 2009 when the dollar was devalued. So we didn't agree, and, and we stabilized, and if things were all right. Now, what so would you do about cost of living? What would you do? We have said so in our manifesto. Yes. There are a number of, uh, we will look at, we'll review 
the duty on uh, which have been uh, levied on uh, uh, you've a said you, you, your, your party has said that you will further extend the list of basic food that yeah uh, the vet free mm. which uh, you've got a list of items already because there's a list already that there is a list and mind you we were the first government to take well we're going to the past uh, now uh, yeah, let's, let's yeah. go forward because the voters are voting into I know, I know, but, so they would we, need to but, know. But, but we set the foundation for it, right? right? But, but, but as you said, in your own words, and people go to vote, they also need to consider the future. Yes. And, uh, so you're saying, what would be the additional items that you'll add? We will look at that. We said we'll review. You don't have a list at the moment? We have a list, but I, have not don't, I don't have it with me okay. here. You're yeah, saying also some other consumer items that yeah. will go zero. Yeah. Yeah. And how will you replace that income that's coming through? Uh, those income uh, that uh, those items definitely uh, are charged vet at the moment 15 percent and if you lose money somewhere you need to get it from somewhere how would you get that well there are other sources from which money can be uh, the shortfall can be uh, obtained now uh, in terms of when we in 2000 when we wanted to reduce or take off VAT from a number of items. I was then advised by my uh, finance ministry and customs officials that uh, this would result in a revenue shortfall of so much and it shouldn't be done but we had made a promise to the people and we went ahead with it and the revenue didn't suffer. We can do it by better compliance, we can do it by uh, raising the same amount of revenue from luxury items. There are other ways of doing it and the other, the other way of doing so it is by, cu by cutting government expenditure. Unnecessary expenditure can be cut and therefore there are two ways of uh, balancing the book. One is by raising revenue or second is by cutting expenditure and there is a lot of expenditure uh, which uh, um, in our view today uh, is uh, you know uh, extravagant. Thank you very much. Saroj Sharma from Narere has got a question. Good evening, Saroj. He's just saying that we were not given chance. He was there for one year. For one year. When Banyama came, he started delivery from the first day. Even the roads in Narere, just about 7th or 8th of December, it started. I've been to Narere and I've seen the state of the roads there. That's shocking. Which Narere are you referring to, madam? She's gone already, uh, <laughs> so you disagree with her. Amelia Karanavanua is uh, online. Uh, good evening, Amelia. Okay, thank you. Uh, if uh, the party comes into government, what will you do to improve the primary health care services in, the, in our hospitals? And uh, secondly, we continue to with this uh, free tuition education. Thank you. Thank you very much. That's a very good question. If you have our manifesto on, on healthcare system, it's on page 11. We've given a number of uh, uh, measures which we will take. Uh, we'll first of all establish a national health scheme, uh, similar to Medicare schemes abroad, which will bring uh, good quality healthcare to all our hospitals and health centers and which will also be available to the poor. Second is we'll outsource the management of uh, specialist and divisional hospitals such as the CWM, Lautoka, Lombasa and Nandi to private health care providers to raise the standard of curative health care. There will be no job losses and these hospitals will be, uh, uh, full-fledged hospitals will also be constructed in places like Nasinu and Ba with, uh, uh, where, where the population is high and the contracting out management will bring in expertise and technology not usually available through the public service system so these are measures that we have in mind in terms of improving hospital and uh, health center services there is a need to also recruit specialist doctors and uh, other paramedical staff also to uh, increase the pay of doctors and nurses and paramedics who are today leaving the country and going abroad. I think we need to retain them here, and if we have to retain them here, then we have to pay them uh, proper, uh, proper salaries, which will 
keep them here. How much money will be allocated for all this uh, hospital and uh, health center development and, of course, more pay? Certainly, it, it will mean uh, increasing the budgetary allocation. Where will you get it from? You Good. just spoke about government expenditure, so have you, have you done your numbers? How much more would you need? <laughs> In terms of economic management, financial management, I think Labour has a track record. No, but I'm asking you, how much more would you need to well, do those things? Well, I can't tell you that at the moment. Okay. Right? Because we don't have the figures. Uh, the government accounts are not published and we don't know act the actual state of what is happening in government. So we need to go in there, look at it. But certainly we know one thing that healthcare needs to be improved significantly. And I think the lady has uh, talked about uh, primary healthcare, preventive healthcare. That is very important. And we've said in our manifesto, we will lay greater emphasis on primary or preventive healthcare. A vigorous campaign will be directed against the increasing incidence of substance abuse such as yangona, alcohol, drugs, cigarettes, which are major causes of illnesses among our people. So there needs to be a very active and effective campaign uh, on, the, on the primary and preventive health care. And uh, <coughs> there also there are fees and charges which have been in introduced lately by uh, the regime, hospital fees and charges, which some of which are outside uh, the uh, affordability of uh, the poor people. So these also need to be reviewed, but certainly there is no doubt that uh, health care system needs to be looked at and uh, improved significantly. Now you're also proposing $100 pensions for elderly citizens. Will this be cash? How many people will benefit from this? How much money will be allocated towards this? This will be paid to people who don't have any other source of income, who are not in receipt of any other type of pension. And uh, <coughs> we have uh, done a quick calculation on this. And on the outside, we feel that this can be done uh, within a sum of five to five to eight million dollars. Okay. Thank you. Uh, we've got uh, our next caller online, Diana from Pacific Harbor. Good evening, Diana. Good evening, Mr. Chaudhry. My question is, do you support the Golingoli bill, Vinaka? Mr. Chaudhry? <laughs> the Golingoli bill, we did not support it, uh, as you know, when uh, it was brought for the first time in uh, 2006. 2006. We didn't support it, and our position is still the same. Still the same. So Delpa was here, and they have said that they will bring back the Golingoli bill? Mm, yes. What will your stand be on that? Well, that is their policy. Our policy is we'll oppose the going. Well, you're saying you're likely to have a coalition with them uh, after the elections? I said depending on policies. Okay, so policies some policies. of those policies then would affect you in making that decision? But nothing prevents us, Vijay, from sitting down together and talking about this. Now, some of these things where we have a difference in policy, they can be put aside for the time being. And they can be looked at. And attempts can be made to reconcile or reach a, a accommodation and an agreement. On the Goli Goli bill, I think the principal objection to that came from the tourism industry. Now, I think one easy solution to that is the uh, service turnover tax that is being extracted from the tourism and tourism related industries. All services. Yes. And a percentage of that tax could be given to the Golingoli owners. So it does not the hurt anybody. The Fiji Law Society had made an assessment in 2006. The person responsible was Israeli Far uh, during the consultations, parliamentary consultations, and they made an independent assessment and said that the Golingoli bill should not come into place because if you change the ownership uh, from state to customary owners, uh, there could be a lot of problems uh, as far as sovereignty is concerned. Um, and, and you may remember uh, when that uh, presentation was made to the parliamentary subcommittee. What's, what's your thought on that? No, no, our, our position has always been that coastal waters, the ownership of coastal waters should be vested in the state. There is no two ways about that. That is our position. But then we also respect the traditional rights of the people. I think that also has to be taken into account. You can't completely write that off. And uh, this is how it's, it's done in New Zealand, that the 
owners of the resources have been given compensation, the coastal waters remains, the ownership remains with the state. Now the same can be done here and compensation can be paid out of the, uh, the tax. service turnover tax. It doesn't hurt anybody. So the ownership remains with the state. The uh, Golingoli owners or the traditional owners get uh, their uh, uh <coughs> side of the, the they get their share of the bargain and then things go on. So now uh, we've got uh, next call online, Arvin Kumar from Australia. Good evening, Arvin. When is Judge Face holding up in Fiji? And we Indian community and other community we uh, get a meeting in the public place and we have a collect. Uh, everybody give two hundred fifty dollars and the Brisbane City Council give ten ten thousand dollars and all these uh, Hindu con community, Hindu Monday associations, all this collecting money and they put it to the Chaudhry's trust and where that money goes to. Mr Chaudhry? I can't get the question. They said they collected funds after the two thousand coup. Who collected these funds? These uh, citizens in Australia. You didn't get any of that? No. I don't know who they collected it for. Who's the caller anyway? Arvind Kumar from Australia. Well, if he's got some, uh, some evidence that I went there collecting money. No, he, he said he, they collected it for you. No, that is not correct at all. I don't know. No, on money collection? Yes. That money from India? Yes, indeed. Uh, you, uh, on the, in the court record, when the ruling was made, one of the issues that was highlighted by Justice Madigan was, uh, this is from the court ruling, the issue of these funds was raised in Parliament on the 2nd of December 2005 by the then Prime Minister Lysenia Garse. The court ruling states, public record of proceedings Hansard, which was before uh, him, that uh, the affidavits were given to him, uh, the judge, reveals that Mahendra Pal Chaudhry vehemently denied the existence of the monies such disdain for the gift and its purpose and such deceit in hiding its existence for so long from the authorities can only be an aggravating factor in this sentence. Why did you not say in Parliament when Mr. Garase asked you the question in, uh, on the 2nd of December 2005 then yes there was money and it was in Australia. Now first of all the comments by Judge Madigan those are completely wrong. We can't go into that, but I'm just asking... No, no, let me, let me finish. That particular comment was excluded. But nonetheless, th they're completely wrong. Mr. Ngarase made an allegation against me that I had received money, and he alluded to the fact that, uh, to that I had received this money by way of a commission from the... Uh, Exim Bank on sugar industry loan that was made to Fiji. That was his allegation and also his allegation that uh, Mr. Chautala from India had collected some money and given it to me. Now, now, I gave a full answer to those. Neither did I receive money from any commission and the Exim, I had an Exim, Exim Bank letter which said very clearly that they don't pay commission and no commission was paid on this loan. I also, uh, in Parliament, I also answered to Mr. Garas's allegation about the Chautala money. That was also denied. Now, this money which I received from the government of India, mind you, it was not received from any other sources. The government of India deposited this money in my account, and I have a letter to prove it here. I'm glad you asked this question, because this is being uh, bandied around by my political opponents uh, to discredit me. And the monies that I received were clean monies. There was no doubt about that. And here is a letter from the Ministry of External Affairs, Government of India, which clearly shows that the money was sent by the people. And I'll read this to you. Yes. To you, and you, you can have a look at it. And I'll read to you what was Garase's question after this, because it was not just about Exim Bank. Well, let me read this money, because this is the money you're talking about. I didn't receive any other money. Let me make it very clear. Yeah, well, people need to know. Yes, of course. Yeah. This, is, this is why it is. It's very good that you'll clear this out on air tonight, yes, Mr. Indeed, Chaudhry. Indeed. And this is a letter dated December 14 December 2004 from the Ministry of External Affairs, New Delhi. And it is addressed to me, Honorable Mahendra Chaudhry, 
GPO Box 17791, uh, dear sir. I am directed to refer to your communication dated 6 October 2004 addressed to the Honorable External Affairs Minister and wish to confirm that in view of this strong public outrage in India due to your illegal arrest and persecution of your family in 2000, the then Honorable Prime Minister has a special gesture authorized transfer of funds collected by the Indian public through our Consul General in Sydney to enable you and your family to be taken care of due to the political upheavals in Fiji at that time. As I happen to be the Consul General of India in Sydney from June 1995 to March 2001, I am personally aware of the whole background of the funds as deposited into your account by the Consulate General in India. Now this money was put into my account, deposited not by me in my account, but by exactly. the Consul General. Exactly. Fine. So the money was already in your account. The but why didn't you declare it? No. But Mr. Garasi's allegation no, okay. was not about this Mr. money Mr. from the government of India. Mr. Garasi asked, and I quote, Mr. Speaker, sir, I also want to put to rest the misleading and mischievous statements, as, as you were saying, uh, by the Honorable Leader of Opposition following his various visits to India. I challenge him to tell us the complete truth about the funds that were raised there for him in Haryana State. Where are those funds now and what are they used for? How much money is held in bank accounts and who are the signatories? That's a separate issue. And then, in your personal explanation, I quote, I would hasten to add that at no time did I ask Sri Chautala to launch an appeal, which he did at a public meeting in Haryana in the course of my visit to India, following my release from captivity. The visit was undertaken in August 2000. The Haryana meeting organized by Sri Chautala was held on 17th August 2000. You continue and I quote, I was surprised at this initiative to raise money and asked him afterwards as to how he proposed to deal with the matter. He informed me that the money collected would be deposited in a bank account and handed over to me to assist with our struggle for the farmers and ordinary people who are suffering here. And the quote continues, on my visit to New Delhi in February 2001, I was asked by the media there whether Sri Chautala had handed over the money. I responded by saying that I had not the occasion to discuss the matter with him, but would do so in the course of my visit. My concern is not so much that the substantial sum of money collected by Chautala has not been handed over to me. My anger about the whole episode that Sri Chautala should exploit the feelings of the ordinary and poor folks of Haryana who would emotionally die to leave and to the people of the Indian origin to Fiji and play on them the game of deceit for self-enrichment. Mm. Now what is this? Well, this Mr. Chautala, you ask him, because I never received any money. But you admit that there was funds being collected yes. under your name for the people who, who were affected uh, at uh, Lotoka Gilmut Centre and uh, Valelawa. I did not authorize anyone to collect funds on my behalf. Let me put this very straight. Mr. Tautala did that in his own initiative, and those monies never reached me. So you didn't get any cent of that money? No. So this money is from where? This money is from government of India. It was for you to resettle somewhere. Yeah. Of course, uh, at that time when you had come, uh, you had gone overseas uh, after the 2000 coup, a lot of people wanted to fundraise because there were issues with uh, uh, some people had gone and were staying, staying at refugee centers. Um, you didn't think of using this money to help them? I wasn't here then. No, you I wasn't. left in July and I didn't get back to Fiji until after October. When you came back, the Valilewa camp was still going on. Valilewa camp was going on and it was being uh, looked after by the National Farmers Union, yes. yes so, yeah. so this money, when you didn't resettle in Australia, because you believe that Fiji is the country that you will still stay on in, why didn't you return the money? They, they, because they had given it to you for a specific reason. When this happened, two of my children went abroad. They were there. They, they bought homes. The money was used, part of it. For the settlement. Children. Yes. Okay. And why, and you didn't, why you did not declare the money, Mr. Chaudhary? The money was declared. You didn't declare. And I declared it. And when I did, paid when tax. Did you, when did you declare? I declared it in 2004. And the tax has been paid. On that, and there was a government inquiry into this matter in 2008, which cleared me. No, okay. it's clearly stated that so the, your conviction is clear that you breached the Exchange Control Act. No, I did. Well, that is not. That is not. That is not a new law. 
No. Mr. Chaudhry, that is not a new law. You are former finance minister, you are former prime minister. You know the rules very, very well. I, this matter is before the court. Now, I still maintain I have not breached the Exchange Control Act. I have appealed this, uh, this decision. Don't leave it there. No, 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 don't leave it there because I want this yeah. matter clarified. Okay. I don't want, I want this matter clarified. Right. There was a report of ind independent inquiry on this very issue in 2008. That is, that is not a court. Uh, Never mind what it's not a full investigation and no. a court yeah, decision, yeah, Mr. Yeah. Chaudhry. Nonetheless, you, talk, you said that I had breached the Exchange Control Act. The terms of reference was whether there was any breaches of the Exchange Control Act by Mahendra Pal Chaudhary. And this inquiry found me that there was, there was no breach. Now the matter ended up in court. After I was cleared by this inquiry on the same facts as went to the court, the inquiry was concluded in March 2008. I was cleared of all the charges. The Reserve Bank was a party to this inquiry. It was a party to this inquiry. And they did not dispute the findings of the inquiry at that time and strangely 17 months after this report was l done I get charged for 12 counts 12 of 12 counts they, they had sent you some letters before that they sent me a letter hmm. yes but that was after 17 months hmm. right then I was charged in July 2010 inquiry was concluded in 2008 March I was charged in July 2010 Reserve Bank was a party to this inquiry now uh, they charged me for money laundering, they charged me for tax evasion, and they charged me for exchange control. Like there were 12 charges. Nine were thrown out in the first hearing. Only three uh, charges relating to exchange control act remained. And they're still before the courts. The Court of Appeal has decided we appeal to the Supreme Court. So, the whole thing here is, why were these charges on money laundering brought in? Why were the charges on tax evasion brought in when there was, I did not have any problems with the Commission of Inland Revenue. There was no question about money laundering. This was all pre-planned by this regime. Well, that's to charge me to keep, no, not that's my assumption. assumption. That, that is a fact because that's your the assumption. line of these charges were thrown out as, as said, abuse of process. As I said, there's an there's a inquiry that you're talking about and there's another one that is the court that made the decision. So we shall move on because you have appealed the case. I think it's better for you, Mr. Chaudhary, because you may use some grounds in the appeal to try to win your case. We'll see what happens in court. We'll definitely cover your case and uh, uh, we'll see what happens, what, what, what will be the final decision. Now, talking about money, talking about budgets, you were the finance minister in 2007. That year, the military bust its budget by $45.5 million. The budgeted allocation was $81 million. The actual amount spent was $126 million. You were the finance minister. How were you controlling the funds and why such a big bust? Well, the military budget actually was operating independently of the budget being controlled by the finance ministry and this had been always the case attempts by previous governments to bring the military budget under their control did not succeed and we've always we commented on that and then i have also said so that military in the last 10 years we took out figures and <coughs> every year the military overshot its budget it's 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 been happening without uh, <coughs> exception so, as I said, that the military budget was being administered by them, independent of the finance ministry. And this had to be brought in within the finance ministry. Previous attempts had failed. And you would know probably the reason for that. So, you couldn't, you couldn't check no, what was happening, I could, I what must have occurred. Yes. Of course, funds would have been moved around. Finance ministry would have to be involved in they that. They would overspend and that's it. The, the monies would be paid and we'd find out later. And there was, like the payment of compensation. No, but if you allocated a certain budget yes. and then you almost hitting it, like if it's 81 million and you need another 40, 45 million, you definitely you'd have to pull from somewhere else. The military can't do that. The finance ministry has to reallocate. No, they would, they would overdraw. And uh, this is what I'm saying, that uh, the attempts by finance ministry to control the budget in the past had failed. I don't know what's the situation now. But every year, without fail, they would overshoot their budget. That, that goes to show that the finance military ministry had very little control over military budget. And I, I would assume it's the same same today. So here, you, you as a minister had very little control over that budget? We had absolutely no control. 
Now, Ashnil Chan from uh, Suva County's uh, uh, Suva. I, I don't know where they're from, but uh, yeah, it's from Suva. Ashnil Chan. Yeah, your question, Ashnil. Um, hello, Mr. Choudhury. Um, hello, Mr. Vijay Narayan. The current state of the finance of the government is uh, kind of deteriorating. As we can see the key indicators, so what is your strategy in uh, bringing the uh, finance uh, back to if in a normal state after the Auditor General has been published and uh, we see that the state finances are not uh, very good? Yes, indeed, uh, that is uh, what we ourselves suspect, but at the moment we are completely bereft of any information on the actual state of government finances. As we've been saying for the last seven years, the sta sta statements of uh, accounts and finances of the government have not been published. Reports of the Auditor General have not been published. So we have no idea at this stage how government finances are doing, but we do know that uh, they are uh, uh, not sound. Any incoming government will have to make an assessment uh, once uh, they are elected uh, to see the actual state of government finances and a particular worry of course is the high debt level that is uh, that is a very big worry uh, for for us at this time and also for international financial institutions which have warned the government that their debt level is too high and it could pose a threat to uh, uh, government finances in the future so there are uh, areas uh, which uh, are disturbing but as I said uh, it, these can only be addressed when full information uh, is available. Mr. Choudhury, uh, the ADP had re uh, ADB had released a report saying growth is projected to moderate to 2.8 percent this year uh, as record investment growth levels off and uh, we have uh, more effects of one-off tax cuts and higher tax thresholds. The economic outlook continues to improve on previous projections and early growth indicators are positive for 2014 uh, amongst a whole lot of things when they uh, uh, when they analyze. One of the downside risks to growth is the large public debt, which are equal to 48% of GDP. What will you do to reduce public debt? Well, we'll have to, of course, debt that has already been taken, that will have to be repaid. I was looking and at the uh, debts. Yes. Well, let's, let's go to the no. debts now. Let's, uh, it's, it's interesting. Because it's all in the records, and you could, uh, as you're saying, this financial statements are missing. Is a quick look at uh, the Fiji budget estimates book, which uh, actual uh, actuals also there, and a whole lot of details there on interest. Because there's some talk that we don't know the interest rates, but uh, the there's uh, loans going back right back to 1988 even, which haven't been paid which is interesting that uh, they still continue 13 million US dollars the loan taken in 1988 1993 1993 uh, there's a few there up to then then of course the debt level then has increased over time to uh, uh, as far as uh, overseas loans are concerned uh, to over 1.5 billion dollars and uh, of course the total debt sits at uh, according to the budget sep uh, supplement 3.8 billion that's domestic and uh, uh, external combined now with that what what can you do because you 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 will have that situation as any other government that has come from 1988 has had that situation as it has built over the years mm -hmm. what can you do well the, these, these are long-term commitments these debts and we'll have to see uh, what can be done to pay off some of the more expensive uh, loans that have, that were taken and uh, when we were in office, uh, that's what we did in 2000. We looked at the the debt portfolio, and we uh, then uh, repaid the loans which were expensive because uh, we shopped around and, and money could be obtained for lesser interest. And uh, we borrowed from that uh, from those sources to repay the uh, the expensive loans. There are other other measures, uh, but these these are the issues which can only be best dealt once uh, you are in there and you have the full details. If you do go in and then you'll have to assess. Because our, our, our objective would be to reduce 
the debt level to around 40% of the GDP. The interesting thing, you reduce debt level, but you have to continue with your repayments, and then you got caught with a situation you want to do all these other things, uh, which will cost money, and if you reduce uh, taxes for certain items, then you reducing your income, so it will be an interesting scenario when it plays out, Mr. Chaudhary. Yes, but we hope that uh, uh, going back to parliamentary rule will provide the necessary stability which will improve the investment levels in the country, which will, uh, uh, will of course, uh, give a uh, new life to the economy. And as a result, uh, when uh, economic uh, growth is at acceptable levels, the government revenue will naturally rise. Uh, there needs to be a cut back on expenditure, I think. There is, uh, there is a lot of room for that. So it is not something which can be achieved overnight. The mistakes of the past seven years will take some time to correct. And uh, we can't be sitting here and making assessments on that. We will need to look at it. We'll need to consult the experts on this. As to, but we'll have our objectives there, what to do, and the time frame within which to uh, fulfill those objectives. But that will be after the elections. Yes. Now, uh, moving on to the next question, Lalita from Nambua. Good evening, Lalita. He said that he did not collect the money from Australia and New Zealand. What happened to the money he collected after the coup, 2000 coup from, from America and Canada, that was for the poor farmers. Where did the money go? I don't know why they're saying that I collected money in America and Canada for the farmers. I did no such thing. So I think these questions are coming from my political so opponents. So after 2000, after 2000 coup, you did go to those other countries. Yes. You didn't, col didn't get any money at all? Not for me, no. Not for you? No. So for who? Did you get something? There was money donated to the Fiji Labour Party, which has been fully accounted for to the Labour Party. So how much was and the total in amount that probably we raised was about between eighty to ninety thousand dollars. Fijian dollars. Fijian dollars. And what was that used for? That was used for there was a court case, Chandrika Prasad case, which we largely funded, and there was uh, also the uh, the uh, the uh, Valalawa camp where we kept the people who had. Uh, 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 ev evicted from their farms in Lambasa, we c looked after them for 12 months. So this is where all those monies were, were used. This Arvin from Australia has uh, called again. Arvin, good evening. About the Chaudhry sites, the money you didn't receive any in Australia. That's not true. The money you already receive goes to Chaudhry's trust account. The people collect all the money and put it in Chaudhry's account, uh, Chaudhry's trust account. And he's lying. It's not true. And if you go to city council, uh, Brisbane city council, and check with the public in, in Brisbane, that time I given myself $250. Thank you, Arvin. Uh, I think he's asked that question again. Uh, Mr. Chaudhry, you would like to respond to that? I don't know who this Arvin is. I, I didn't receive 25 cents from anybody by the name of Arvin. I think these are all my political opponents. So you collected nothing, up. again, nothing from Australia? No, no temple committees or no, anything that got together and said, we'll help no. Mr. Chaudhry out because he's come out of a coup and some, he's Some people might have collected in my name and pocketed the money, but I certainly didn't receive anything. What is your view on equal citizenry, Mr. Chaudhry? Well, equal citizenry, do you, do you define the term for me? What is equal citizenry? Well, equal citizenry, they're saying that everyone has equal rights to ensure that they... they uh, live together and not that people have different rights mm -hmm. so uh, it's in the constitution mm -hmm. but I would like to know what is your definition of equal right. citizenry now when you say everybody has equal rights equal privileges uh, equal privileges and uh, the would you also say that uh, the rules apply equally to the to all all the citizens of course Mr. Chaudhry so that's equal citizenry right do you think we have equal citizenry in Fiji? I'm asking you. I'm not contesting no. the election, Mr. Chaudhry. Neither no. you, by the way, no. but you're taking a party to the elections. I'm asking you, what do you think of equal citizenry? Because the people out there will have to make a decision based on what the Fiji Labour Party says, whether they will vote for your party or not. I'm not contesting the election. I'm asking you the question for the benefit of the listeners who will go out to vote on September 17th. Yeah, don't get me wrong. What I'm saying is that the regime here is trying to tell everybody that there is equal citizenry in the country when there is not. When there is not, the rules are changed. Some people are more equal than the others, like the Prime Minister, for instance, for himself. 
the age limit for retirement of the commander RFMF was raised. For everybody else in the public service, age 55 is the retirement age. But for Prime Minister's brother, who was High Commissioner in Malaysia, who was, who was over 70, that rule doesn't apply. Right? Now, when you have civil servants with criminal record are out, they're not supposed to be employed. But you have the Prime Minister's brother-in-law who had a criminal record of manslaughter, convicted, jailed, receiving money while in prison and then back as permanent secretary for works. Do we have equal citizenry? He's not the only one. I'm not. I'm not no, defending no, anyone here. But let's 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 just no. look at what you've said. Uh, the issues here, Mr. Chaudhry, uh, like for example, uh, we asked the correction services the question, and they said that's part of yellow ribbon. Even Mr. Kunatumba is out. Joe Nata is out. They are working in different ministries. Mr. Bika is doing some work. So, what do you think? No, these are all excuses. The rules are rules, right? It is because you have a connection somewhere who's able to spring you out of prison, pay you while you're in prison, right? And then give you a top public service job. Do you call this equal citizenry? Is it equal citizenry the Prime Minister must get more than a million dollars a year? You don't, have, when you have, don't have proof for that. No, no. Give I us have, the proof, we look, can talk about that. No, listen, let me, let me tell you. We have challenged him to show the accounts. We have asked that yeah. question. Well, why is he not showing it? Well, the, the, they've said they've right. declared the salaries. No, that is wrong. That they're lying and to give the Give us the evidence. That's give us the right. evidence and we can Evid go with that. Evidence Let's is with him. Evidence is with him. Let him produce the account from April 2010 onwards of the salaries and who was paying them. If he is clean, he would have no hesitation in bringing this out and saying, Chaudhary is lying and this is the record. Okay, let me, let right. me say that. Okay, let me, let me tell you something. But these people are defending the regime. Listen, let, Mr. Chaudhary, you have to understand, we have to follow ethics. At the same time, we have asked the question, yeah. the comment that's been made, even this afternoon, we asked the question, about the Auditor General's reports and all the accounts. They've said, wait for a month. It will come out after the election. So we have asked the question. They maintain their stand that the, it will come out after the general election. Seven years accounts after the general election. That's what they've and said. What do you think of that, Vijay? That's is that accountability? I, I, is that transparency? I'm not, I, I'm not here to Why not? judge any party. No, I'm, I'm asking you your personal you. views. Do you think? No, no, no. I'm here to ask you. You want my personal views, said, but you don't want to give your personal well, you are the leader of the political <laughs> party. Now, let's go on to that. The next point. You are going into the election as a leader who will not be able to go into parliament. Yes. What is your stand on that? You cannot take all these views and issues because you will be outside parliament. As I said. Why did you, t why did you make that move personally for no, you? No, no, no. As the leader of the Labour Party. No, listen. I told you, Vijay, that the whoever goes to parliament, whether it's me or not, or not me, the, the members of the Labour Party in parliament will be bound by the manifesto. So the manifestos, the manifesto has the policies. They will be bound by it, and they will, of course, work within uh, within that. Unless, okay. of course, the, the party changes the, the the policies. Will there be a new leader after the election? There will be a new parliamentary leader. Yes, a new party leader. But part the, if you read the constitution of the Labour Party and its structure, the Labour Party has got its executive, which is the president, the three vice presidents, the secretary general, the assistant secretary general, and the national treasurer. These are the executives of the of the party. Then there is a position also of parliamentary leader. The parliamentary leader is elected by members of parliament of the party. So he is a different entity. And after the elections, those members who will be elected to parliament will meet to elect their party leader. So that means you will finish off after the elections. I am not. A, I will not be parliamentary leader of the party. Yes, but you will be leader of the party. No, no. The parliamentary leader becomes the leader. These are different positions, Vijay. <coughs> I am the secretary general of the party also, and I was parliamentary leader when I was in parliament. That's right. <coughs> Excuse me. There is no parliament now, so no party has a leader, parliamentary leader. They all have secretaries. Same 
same with the Labour Party. I am the Secretary General of the Labour Party. People call me leader of the party. But when you refer to leader, he's the parliamentary leader. And if that party is in power, then the parliamentary leader is the Prime Minister. So at the moment, that is not the situation. So I continue as Secretary General of the party, and that, that is the capacity in which I am functioning at the moment. And uh, parliamentary leader will only come after the elections. <coughs> now, wh what is your plan <coughs> after the elections? Meaning? What is your plan after the election? Because you will not be in parliament. So what is your plan? In relation to what? Uh, Politics. In oh, I see. Well, I'll continue to be uh, assisting the party. I will be with... I will be in the in the party, uh, and I will of course uh, uh, give all the assistance that I can to the party, and then continue as secretary general until I am replaced uh, uh, in, uh, in in time. Mr. Chaudhary, you brought up the issue about the auditor general's report. You you were very concerned about it. Other parties are raising it. Uh, definitely, you are going around campaigning. You are also raising this issue uh, quite prominently because uh, we've uh, heard a number of parties. They really want the full auditor general's <coughs> reports out. Labour Party definitely is pushing that. Uh, but uh, the government has said very clearly they will come out with the, all the auditor general's report uh, after the elections. What do you have to say to that? No, these reports are supposed to be <coughs> published annually. Under the Finance Management Act, the reports, in, when, when Parliament is there, the reports were supposed to be tabled in Parliament by August, together with the Auditor General's report. That was the timeline. So by August of each year, the accounts of the previous year, audited accounts, have to be tabled in Parliament. So that's the norm that should be followed. Accounts should be published each year, together with the Auditor General's report. Now, uh, John is calling from Lotoka. Good evening, John. So, Chaudhary, just one question. Uh, you're talking about uh, changing the constitution as well as uh, Delva. Um, what uh, do you say about uh, what the military commander said when they, he said that the military is there to protect the constitution? Minaka. Well, I have given my reasons why the Constitution must be changed. And that is what is in our manifesto also, because the Constitution is not democratic, and it is not in the interest of Fiji to have this type of Constitution. It does not provide for transparency and, accountable, uh, uh, and uh, accountability on the, parts of the government, on the part of the government, and it has a number of serious flaws. Now, of course, we know that this, this constitution is not the people's constitution. It was shoved down our throats by a decree. And therefore, the commander should also understand that. He should understand that the people must have a constitution of which they approve and not something which is shoved down their throat. So it is the responsibility and the duty of every citizen to say, look, this is not our constitution. And this constitution has serious flaws. It is not a democratic constitution. It needs to be changed. And of course, the people will decide on September 17th, Mr. Chaudhry, when they go out to vote for who they want, because it's clear cut who's coming up with what. And as we finish off our show tonight, uh, mm. it was great having you, Mr. Chaudhry. Uh, uh, sorry we didn't take a second break. I know you needed a mm. bit more water there, but uh, we needed to keep it going because there was a lot of calls and a lot of questions. And, uh, of course, uh, straight talk tonight with uh, Fiji Labour Party leader Mr. Mahendra Chaudhry. We're finishing off uh, with uh, him talking about the policies uh, that uh, they have come up with, of course, in the plans of the Fiji Labour Party. We are here to raise the question for you listening out there all around Fiji and all around the world for you to make the decision so that you make an informed decision when you go out to vote at the polling station on September 17th that you have already uh, heard from all the political party leaders what they have to offer, what is their stand on different issues so that you are not confused come September 17th on which way to go because you will be clearly and uh, definitely um, uh, have all the knowledge 
on what the different party policies uh, are as far as the seven parties are concerned. As I said earlier, uh, this Saturday at 3 p.m., uh, the Elections Office will have the draw of the national candidates, and uh, that is when uh, the specific numbers will be drawn with the candidates' names. At the moment, the objection period is underway, and uh, the Electoral Commission is expected to make announcement about uh, the confirmed candidates who will be contesting the September 17th general elections. As I, and as I earlier told you, uh, Straight Talk also will take a break tomorrow night, have a cool-off period, uh, and relax uh, tomorrow night. Uh, and we will be back on Monday night with uh, the leader of the National Federation Party, Dr. Biman Prasad. Jarvis, status report. I'm sorry, sir. We've lost auxiliary power. Shutdown sequence initiated. Don't do this to me, Jarvis. Just a little further. Negative, sir. My computer.